Now let's talk about charges. So this is an important structural trend that's observed on the periodic table. For the time being, I actually want to ignore the transition series. So ignore what's here. And now let's ask what happens when various types of elements show up in ionic compounds. There's actually a very robust trend here that's observed if we constrain ourselves to the main group elements. Group one always forms cations with plus one charge. Group two always forms cations with plus two charge. If we jump over to the other side of the main group now, we see that group 13, when it is found in ionic compounds, forms ions with a charge of plus three. And then when we get to group 14, there's an interesting switch that takes place with, with carbon forming elements, uh, forming ions with charge of negative four, nitrogen negative three, oxygen negative two, and fluorine negative one. And, and if we think about the numbers of electrons in all of these ions, if we look at all of these, and this is something that's worth undertaking on your own, worth verifying on your own, all of these ions have a total of 10 electrons. And in fact, that's the same number of electrons as we find in the neon atom, which is the closest neutral noble gas atom to these elements, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, and fluorine. If we look now at the cations, and I'm actually going to change the cations to blue just to make this distinction uh, a little bit more clear, we have plus one in group one, plus two, in group two, and plus three in group three. And actually all of these, if we again do the math on the number of electrons in the atom, have two electrons. And that two electrons is the same number of electrons as we see in helium right here, the same number of electrons we see in a neutral helium atom. And in fact, lithium plus and beryllium two plus find themselves closest to helium, and so our general principle still applies. Atoms form ions that contain the number of electrons belonging to the closest neutral noble gas on the periodic table. And, and by the way, the two electrons here is for just the second row, Li plus Be2 plus, and the 10 electrons is only for the second row elements here, C4 minus N3 minus O2 minus F minus. The same analysis and the same trend applies below though. All of these ions have the number of electrons corresponding to the number in the closest noble gas. So for P3 minus S2 minus Cl minus, it's argon. For Na plus and Ng2 plus, it's the 10 electrons of the neon atom. So this allows us to predict, just from position on the periodic table for the main group elements, the charge of the ion that that element will form. The other thing this shows us is that the metals tend to form cations and the non-metals tend to form anions. And that's an important thing to keep in mind. We'll notice a little bit later that ionic compounds are derived from the combination of metal cations with non-metal anions. And so seeing metals and non-metals within, for example, a structural formula or an empirical formula or molecular formula gives us a hint that we're looking at an ionic compound. So in the last slide, we focused on the charges in what are called monatomic ions. But very commonly, very, very commonly in practice, we're dealing with ionic compounds that contain charged molecules. And molecules that have a net charge are called polyatomic ions. Breaking the word down, poly just means many. So we've got many atoms inside the ion. It's a polyatomic ion. And they have net positive or negative charge. So here I've got three, so here I have four examples of polyatomic ions. The majority are negative, negatively charged anions, but ammonium, or NH4+, is an important cationic example of a polyatomic ion. And by the way, just to orient ourselves on these pictures, the white atoms are hydrogens, relatively small, which gives us a hint that these are hydrogen atoms. The blue atom is nitrogen. The red atoms that you see in, in many polyatomic ions on this slide and elsewhere are all oxygen atoms. The gray atom is carbon, the yellow atom is sulfur, and the orange atom is phosphorus. And these colors are kind of a standardized color scheme for 
atoms within molecular structures that you'll see as we look at three-dimensional structures throughout the course. So continuing on, now that we've identified all the atoms, we can extrapolate the formulas of these ions. CO3 2 minus is the carbonate ion, and it's 2 minus because it has a net charge of negative 2 with the, these two oxygens formally negatively charged. This SO4 ion with a net charge of negative 2 is called sulfate. And this phosphorus containing ion with a formula of PO4 and a net charge of negative 3 is called phosphate. So these are four examples of polyatomic ions which are extremely common in ionic compounds and extremely important for chemistry. The next couple of slides just survey the polyatomic ions. I won't say too much about these specifics. These are absolutely ions that are worth keeping in mind in, in terms of understanding that the name points to an ion and having at least a vague idea or the ability to look up the uh, charge and formula of the ion. This table gets the point across that the vast majority are anions. Here they're all negative one charges. A little bit later we'll talk about situations in which we can name polyatomic ions systematically. That's highlighted here with the different chlorine oxyanions and the nitrogen oxyanions right here. And for the time being, we're looking at all and for the time being here on this table, we're seeing ions with an overall charge of negative one. So these are just some examples of polyatomic ions. The next slide is very similar. Um, interestingly though, on the next slide, we have some ions with a charge of negative two or even negative three. So polyatomic ions, negative three is about as high as you get, but you can see plus one, minus one, minus two, minus three for the various polyatomic ions. The detailed structures are not so much important but for naming and for, in some cases, thinking about reactivity, the numbers of atoms within the polyatomic ion, especially the number of oxygens for these oxyanions, is worth thinking about. Some polyatomic ions are named systematically. And a couple of guidelines on the systematic naming of polyatomic ions. So the first, if, the ani if it's an anion that contains hydrogen, use the word hydrogen or the prefix by to indicate that. So for, for example, we have three examples of polyatomic ions containing hydrogen. Here they're anions. This one containing uh, sulfate with an extra hydrogen is one way to think about it, or sulfate with an extra proton is referred to as bisulfate. It is sulfate with a hydrogen, hence the prefix bi, or more systematically we might argue hydrogen sulfate. This second example has kind of a phosphate core structure with two hydrogens, and so we can refer to this as dihydrogen phosphate. And the third one only has one hydrogen, and so we can refer to this simply as hydrogen phosphate. Nowadays, the use of the word hydrogen, I would say, is a little more common than the bi prefix. For our purposes, the two approaches are equivalent, and we'll understand each other, whichever one we use. Now, in terms of naming oxyanions, polyatomic ions with oxygen connected to a central element, the number of oxygen atoms connected to the central element gives us a clue to the name, and these are often named systematically based on the number of oxygens. So the ite anion will have some number of oxygens. For the halogens, it's two, and we call for chlorine that ion chlorite. If we add an oxygen to chlorite, we get to chlorate. And you'll see this actually in the tables on the previous slides as examples with chlorine and I believe with nitrogen as well, nitrate and nitrite. If we add yet another oxygen, adding oxygen actually tends to be associated with the prefix per. So per chlorate, when we go from three oxygens in chlorate to four in perchlorate. And then if we go back to chlorite and we remove an oxygen, we get to hypo, hypo indicating a deficiency of oxygens, chlorite. So a deficiency of oxygen relative to chlorite is hypochlorite in here. So at this point we've hit on the charges and some of the names of both monatomic and polyatomic ions. Now it's time to think about the structure of ionic compounds when we start combining 
cations and anions. And on the right-hand side of the slide, I'm just featuring an example of an ionic compound, titanium dioxide, which is found in sunscreen. Now, this is a bit misleading um, because it looks like the titanium dioxide is a liquid or some kind of viscous or, or difficult to flow uh, liquid, but actually titanium dioxide is a solid, and it's in sunscreens, a solid powder suspended in oils. And that's common of ionic compounds. The vast majority of ionic compounds are solids. On the molecular level, they contain cations and anions such that the overall charge is neutral. And this can be important if, for example, we're asked to predict the structure of an ionic compound or the formula of an ionic compound from the elements involved. If we know the charges of the cations and anions involved, using the idea that the compound is electrically neutral, we can extrapolate to what the formula must be in order to ensure neutrality. The oppositely charged ions are held together through electrostatic attraction. Opposites attract. And that attraction is referred to by chemists as an ionic bond. It's just the electrostatic attraction of oppositely charged ions. Now, in a little bit, when we look at molecular compounds, we'll talk about compounds that on the submicroscopic level are made of discrete molecules. And formulas often give the suggestion that compounds on the molecular level or on the submicroscopic level are made of discrete molecules. But that's not the case for ionic compounds. Ionic compounds are not molecular. Instead, their ions are arranged in a lattice. And this is true whether we're talking about monatomic ions or polyatomic ions. And the, the lattice from an individual, say, um, TiO2 units perspective inside titanium dioxide is essentially infinite. And you can see the lattice of titanium dioxide here on the right. Now, we still represent in textual form as a formula the, the formula of titanium dioxide as TiO2. This is an empirical formula, though. It reflects the smallest whole number ratio of titanium and oxygen atoms within the compound. And in fact, if we look at the lattice, we can understand why this is. So focus your attention just on this kind of top row of titanium and oxygen atoms, and let's count the number of titanium and oxygen atoms that we see. We've got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9 titanium atoms. Titanium atoms here are gray, and again, the oxygens are red. And how many oxygen atoms do we have? Well, we have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 oxygen atoms. So within a row, 9 titani titaniums and 18 oxygens, of course, the empirical formula corresponding to that is 1 titanium for every 2 oxygens, or TiO2. So despite the way we write the formula, this does not mean that TiO2 consists of discrete titanium dioxide molecules. Titanium and oxygen ions are arranged in an infinite lattice and held together through electrostatic attraction in, ionic com in this ionic compound. Molecular compounds are composed of discrete molecules. There are some attractions between the molecules within molecular compounds based on forces between the molecules, but here we're going to focus on how the atoms within a molecular compound are held together. So within the small molecule, if we look at structural formulas, we'll see lines that indicate the sharing of electrons, and these are called covalent bonds. Unlike ionic bonds, which are based on electrostatic attraction, covalent bonds are really based on the sharing of electrons. Atoms want to gain electrons generally, or lose electrons in some cases to achieve a noble gas configuration, achieve a number of at least formal electrons corresponding to the closest noble gas, and they can do that by sharing electrons in covalent bonds. So what you see on this slide is an example of a molecular compound. Unlike ionic compounds, they can be gases or liquids. Benzene is a liquid at room temperature. It's a colorless liquid. You can see it in a vial right here. And the molecular level structure of benzene is represented here in three different ways. Here's the structural formula with six carbons and six hydrogens. The molecular formula of benzene is C6H6. Here's a ball and stick model, which just shows 
the atoms as spheres. And here's a space filling model in which the atoms are represented roughly using their relative atomic sizes. Notice here the distinction between molecular and empirical formula again. So the empirical formula of benzene is actually CH or C1H1, while the molecular formula is C6H6. And the structure of benzene was a mystery for quite a while. Um, both because it was unclear what the molecular formula was, and then once C6H6 was determined, exactly how the atoms were connected was quite a mystery. So molecular compounds, though, we tend to think of in terms of discrete molecular structures, and we represent them using the structure of a single molecule, really only bringing in intermolecular interactions, interactions between molecules, when we need to rationalize certain properties. And you'll see that in discussions of intermolecular forces in your later chemistry courses.